for 60 minutes as the design designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've had a series of very heavy storms in California. We've gotten a lot of water. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about what is happening to that water. This is a photo I took a few days ago at the Folsom Dam. 20,000 cubic feet is being released per second, where it is sent on its way to the Pacific Ocean. That staggering amount of water is not available to California farmers, businesses, or residents. Meanwhile, state-sponsored billboards tell people to put a bucket of water in their shower so they can save, they put a bucket in their, a bucket in their shower so they can save that water for gardening. Restaurants are prohibited from serving their customers drinking water unless the customers specifically ask for it. Here are some of the other emergency drought restrictions that have been in effect. Turn off decorative water fountains. Use an automatic shutoff nozzle on your water hose. Use a broom, not water, to clean sidewalks and driveways. Commercial, industrial, and institutional decorative grass should not be watered. Same for the common areas in homeowner associations. Down here, you can see all the enforcement, all the penalties that if you don't follow this. It says here for local jurisdictions, uh, for urban water suppliers, if needed, exercise authority to adopt more stringent local conservation member, measures. Some local authorities have done just that. The Los Virginis Municipal Water District began sending government employees into residents' homes to install flow restrictors. Once installed, you're also barred from watering anything outside, and you're not able to use two appliances needing water at once. One resident said you have to take what's called a Navy shower, two minutes. In Los Angeles, they have the water police, where you, municipalities pay individuals to drive around and check for leaky sw swimming pools, green lawns, or other signs of water use. This is just the beginning. In 2018, the California legislature adopted a statewide limit of 55 gallons of indoor water use per person per day. So a single person living alone can't take a shower and do a load of laundry in the same day. Yet last year, the legislature decided even this was too generous and reduced the allotted water to 42 gallons per day. Then, of course, there's the impact on farmers. For both 2021 and 2022, surface water deliveries dropped by 43%. An estimated 752,000 acres lay idle in 2022. The uh, general manager of the Glen Calusa Irrig Irrigation District said, we typically plant 100,000 acres of rice in our district, and this last year we planted 1,000 acres. It's just a massive, massive impact, he said. As a result, $1.7 billion in crop revenues were lost in 2022 and an estimated 19,400 jobs. These drastic sacrifices have been required of Californians because of a supposed lack of water. We prayed for rain, and then the rain comes, and this happens. Here is the overall impact of this image, and others like it throughout the state. So far this year, October through mid-March, the net outflow, this is after pumping, from the Delta into the San Francisco Bay is 11.6 million acre feet. Meanwhile, the state has only pumped 1.2 million, 1.0 million acre feet into the California aqueduct, and the Federal Bureau of Reclamation has only pumped 826,000 acre feet into the Delta Mandata Canal. So, with this record precipitation, that means 13% of Delta outflows have been captured. The rest is squandered. If we were able to capture this water, we wouldn't have to worry about floods, and we wouldn't have to worry about droughts. Communities wouldn't be put at risk, farmers wouldn't have to fallow their fields, citizens wouldn't have to take shorter showers. The reason we aren't capturing it isn't because this water is somehow inherently elusive. 
it's because there's simply no place to put it. California has not seen a new water storage project in at least 30 years, despite many promising potential projects that have been in the planning stages since the 1950s. In 2014, California voters said enough is enough and passed a $7.5 billion water bond. Build water storage, the voters said, yet nothing has been built. In the nine years since, no significant project has materialized. Endless litigation, mind-numbing bureaucracy, and most of all, a lack of political will have been a recipe for inaction. The executive director of the most significant project, Sites Reservoir, said that in my experience, my experience is that for every one year of construction, you have about three years of permitting. It doesn't need to be this way. The massive Folsom Dam, of which this is the auxiliary spillway, holds about a million acre feet of water and took less than a decade in the late 1940s and early 1950s to build. In addition to failing to build any new in-stream or off-stream reservoirs, California has also rejected all but one proposed desalination plant and is taking advantage of a small fraction of the potential for water treatment. And even now, amidst the current record precipitation, our state and federal pumps still aren't operating at full capacity. In short, this uniquely Californian absurdity of alternating or even simultaneous floods and droughts is not some inevitable byproduct of our climate or geography. It is the direct product of political failure. We have more than enough tools at our disposal to have a sustainable, secure supply of water for all users. This image needs to be a wake-up call for California's leaders at the state and federal level. No more excuses. Let's solve this problem now. Let's end this era of floods and droughts, of shorter showers and fallow fields. Let's liberate our constituents from this regime of enforced scarcity and give Californians the abundant supply of water they deserve. This is California's problem, but it affects the entire country. California agriculture feeds the nation and the world. And we could never have become the state that we are, or at least once were, a state that used to lead the country in so many good ways, without the dams, aqueducts, pipes, tunnels, canals, plants, pumping stations built by previous generations. We need to summon the can-do spirit of our forebearers. And we don't even need their ingenuity. We just need basic competence. Effective water management was indispensable to California's 20th century rise and is just as indispensable to reversing its 21st century decline. Madam Speaker, this last week, two court decisions in California delivered a near fatal blow to one of the worst laws that has ever been passed, the California law known as AB5, that destroyed the livelihoods of countless people, wiping out hundreds of professions in our state. These court decisions have significant ramifications for three matters of national importance. First, the recently reintroduced PRO Act, which seeks to nationalize California's ban on independent work. Second, a proposed Department of Labor rule that seeks to do much the same thing through the bureaucracy. And third, the upcoming confirmation hearings for President Biden's nominee for Secretary of Labor, Julie Su, who as California's Labor Secretary was an architect and lead enforcer of AB5. The PRO Act, the Labor Rule, Julie Su. It's a multi-pronged assault on the right to earn a living in America, a concerted strategy to limit or eliminate the gig economy, freelancing, independent contracting, self-employment, and other alternate work arrangements that entire careers are based on and entire industries have been built around. If this strategy is successful, 
It will be devastating for the American economy and American workers. We know that because of the devastation California has already experienced. When he signed AB5 in late 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom rendered countless Californians spanning hundreds of professions unable to earn a living in our state. Videographers and caricaturists, transcriptionists and interpreters, technicians and engineers, analysts and consultants, musicians and conductors, artists and dancers, writers and editors, coaches and trainers, teachers and tutors, nurses and doulas, hardly an industry or profession is unscathed. And the consequences go well beyond just the affected professions. To take one example, thousands and thousands of truckers are at risk of being taken off the road, throwing supply chains into chaos. AB5 is a law so bad that California voters have repudiated it, repudiated it and the legislature has granted over 100 exemptions to prof professions with enough influence at the Capitol. These two developments, the clearly expressed will of California voters and the scattershot exemption process, were the subjects of last week's court decisions. In the first decision, the California Court of Appeal unanimously upheld Proposition 22, an initiative passed by California voters in 2020. Prop 22 repealed AB5 for one category of independent contractors, app-based drivers. Uber, to take one example, was going to have to terminate up to 80% of its drivers because of AB5 and nearly had to stop operating in our state altogether. Their drivers who prize the flexibility of being able to simply switch on the app whenever they want to work were appalled at the prospect of being assigned to fixed shifts, minimum work requ hour requirements, and more if they were able to drive at all. So Prop 22 was proposed to preserve the independent contracting model for these drivers and enable services like Uber and Lyft to continue in California. In November 2022, Prop 20, uh, November 2020, Prop 22 passed overwhelmingly with 59% of the vote. This is the one time that AB5 has been subject to a direct vote of the people, and California voters decisively rejected it. Yet tellingly, the special interest groups behind AB5 then tried to defy the will of voters, tying up the initiative in arcane legal challenges. But last Tuesday, a state appellate court put an end to this anti-democratic nonsense. The court respected the will of voters and upheld the initiative. The justices acknowledged the people of California had chosen to overturn AB5 and protect independent contracting. So for the dozens of Democrat members of Congress sponsoring the PRO Act, take notice, your position is at odds with the voters of even my own very blue state. There was a second decision on AB5 last week of perhaps even greater significance. This one, also a unanimous ruling, was from a federal appeals court. Overruling a district court decision, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held in favor of independent contractors who alleged AB5 violates the United States Constitution. Specifically, it is an equal protection violation. By granting over 100 exemptions to AB5, the court wrote, the legislature has not only refuted its own justification for the law, but it has picked and chosen who is allowed to work and who isn't without any rational basis. Indeed, the court referred to the, quote, piecemeal fashion in which the exemptions were granted, saying this, quote, lends credence to plaintiff's allegations that exemptions were the result of a lobbying and backroom dealing as opposed to adherence to the stated purpose of the legislation. The court wrote that who is subject to the law and who isn't could plausibly be, quote, attributed to animus rather than reason, and that the state's policy of now enforcing AB5 on some but not others borders on corruption, pure spite, or naked favoritism. For this reason, the court found that the constitutional case against AB5 passes the rational basis test, which is notoriously difficult to pass. Under that standard, a court will only strike down a law if there is not any reasonably conceivable state of facts that could provide a rational basis for it. 
In this case, the court explained that even under the, this fairly forgiving standard of review, we conclude that plaintiffs plausibly alleged that AB5 violates the Equal Protection Clause. Why in the world would a law that, per the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, lacks any rational basis be transformed into national policy, ensnaring millions of Americans in its web of corruption, animus, and economic failure? Why would we take a law so bad that legislatures felt the need to unconstitutionally award 100 exemptions to their friends and say this is our model for the American workforce. There is no good reason at all, no good reason why a law that the voters of deep, Califor deep Blue California rejected should be the template for national labor relations, as the PRO Act seeks to do. No reason why a law that cannot be justified by any reason reasonably conceivable state of facts should be imposed by executive fiat nationwide, as the Biden administration's labor rule would do, and no reason why an architect and ruthless enforcer of that law, former California Labor Secretary Julie Hsu, should be elevated to the highest labor office in the land. Julie Hsu's historic failure to deliver unemployment checks to millions of Californians, along with her allowance of the largest fraud of taxpayer dollars in history, are easily disqualifying from the standpoint of competence. But it is her mistreatment of California workers through the ruthless enforcement of AB5, even during the COVID shutdowns, that truly makes her unfit for this position. The voters of California repudiated Julie Su with the passage of Prop 22. Two separate appeals courts repudiated Su with last week's decisions. It is time for President Biden to withdraw this nomination. And if he refuses, I urge the United States Senate to join California voters, California judges, and federal judges in rejecting this nominee. Madam Speaker, in recent weeks, my district has lost several of its most distinguished citizens. I wanted to share a few words about their lives and the legacy they have left in our communities. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Rex Heim, a committed public service, first servant, veteran, native Californian, and friend to many. Rex's life was guided by a commitment to serving others and a work hard, play hard attitude that endeared him to people across California. In fact, Rex's habit of regularly walking the halls of the state capitol in Sacramento and testifying in a Hawaiian shirt rather than the customary suit and tie, was by some accounts single-handedly responsible for relaxing the dress code at the Capitol building, which is appreciated by many. Rarely would Rex let a meeting or conference call end without making everyone laugh and lightening the mood of the conversation. Rex also spread joy to others through serving as the chair, vice chair, and board member at the Calexpo State Fair for over 20 years. His passion for bringing joy to others through the fair was widely recognized as five different governors from both political parties continued to appoint Rex to the California State Fair Board. Rex's service to his community and country extended far beyond the fair. He served in both the Army Reserve and California National Guard, retiring as a major in 1990. Rex was also a member of the California Task Force on Violence Prevention, a regent of the University of California, and president of the Cal Og Aggie Alumni Association. Apart from his community work, Rex worked as president and CEO of the California Business Properties Association for 37 years, and was often instrumental in protecting taxpayers and helping craft legislation that served as models for states across the country. I am honored to have known Rex. He was a devoted husband and father, and our community in California will never impact, forget the impact that Rex Keim had and continues to have on our lives through his service, advocacy, and work throughout his 75 years. Madam Speaker, I rise to honor the memory of Martin Harmon, a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and beloved member of the Roseville community who passed away in February at the age of 88. 
Martin lifted the lives of thousands of members of the community through his charitable foundation, which supported hospitals, churches, cancer research, substance abuse programs, the arts, disaster relief efforts, and children's programs throughout the Sacramento area. He impressed upon his family the importance of making a positive difference and is survived by his cherished wife, Catherine Harmon, nine children, 33 grandchildren, and 29 great-grandchildren. Martin also embodied the American entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. He started his career at age nine by selling cookware door to door during World War II, and later parlayed his experience working behind a butcher's counter into opening his own market and meatpacking company as a teenager. At the age of 27, Martin purchased his first nursing home in Auburn, which presaged his future as a developer and contractor. Martin's wide-ranging developments, from medical office buildings and shopping centers to subdivisions and apartments, leave behind a profound legacy for his children and grandchildren. I was honored to know Martin, and our community will never forget the impact that Martin Harmon has had and will continue to have on our lives for many, many years to come. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Dr. Paul Dugan, a committed physician and pillar of the Roseville community who sadly passed away in February at the age of 92. Dr. Dugan served countless members of the Roseville community and Sacramento area through his work as a physician. His passion for caring for others through medicine sparked by an early affliction of polio is abundantly clear through his life's work. Ever since moving to Roseville in 1963, Dr. Dugan regularly spent weekends making house calls and serving uninsured patients, friends of patients, and tirelessly advocating for public health awareness. Paul and his wife Olga even started the first ever mass CPR training program, Start a Heart, in 1978. The program ran continuously for 19 years and was later replicated as CPR Saturday across the country and internationally by the American Red Cross. Dr. Dugan doubtlessly saved countless lives through his leadership in organizing and executing the Star to Heart program and his service as a physician. Dr. Dugan's passion for serving others extended beyond medicine and beyond Roseville. Dr. Dugan served on the Roseville Planning uh, Commission, helping shape Roseville into the city it is today. He served as president as the Roseville Chamber of Commerce and was recognized by community members as Roseville's Citizen of the Year in 1978 and 1992. Dr. Dugan was also selected to serve on the California Board of Medical Examiners by both Governor Ronald Reagan and Governor Jerry Brown, and he assisted in credentialing the UC Davis School of Medicine. I was honored to know Paul, and our community will never forget Dr. Paul, D Paul Dugan and the tremendous impact he has had on his patients as residents of Roseville through his service as a physician and leadership in the community. Madam Speaker, I rise to honor the memory of Greg Van Dusen, a pillar of the Sacramento area community. Greg was born in Sacramento in 1950, and from an early age had a passion for serving others and for sports. Greg's service and leadership was recognized by his peers after he served as student body president in 1968, and he later served a 12-month combat tour in Vietnam. After returning from Vietnam, Greg combined his passion for service and sports by working tirelessly to facilitate the move of the Sacramento Kings from Kansas City to Sacramento in 1985. As a result of Greg's efforts, generations of Sacramento area residents have become diehard Kings fans, although admittedly it's been pretty tough uh, in many recent years. Uh, but the team's uh, somewhat unexpected uh, success this season, I think, is a, is a tremendous tribute to Greg. Greg was also a devoted father and grandfather, helping shape his three sons into the men they are today. He always looked forward to visits with his grandkids, attending their sporting events, and teaching them life lessons. His son, Brett, remembers him as a brilliant mind, a hardworking, compassionate father and grandfather, and always willing to help anyone who asked. I was truly honored to know Greg. Uh, he, was, he was a good friend, and our community will never forget the impact that Greg Van Duden has had and will continue to have on our lives through his passion for serving others. Madam Speaker, 
I'd like to take a moment to honor the life and memory of Alan Zarenbergen, a beloved member of the Sacramento area community and a kind-hearted public servant. Alan's impact has been felt for over 40 years at the California State Capitol, including for 23 years as president of the California Chamber of Commerce. Alan held a deep commitment to forging constructive compromise with anyone willing to help deliver results for the people of California, listening respectfully and kindly to everyone's opinions, and building trust through honest deal-making, the very embodiment of how politics ought to be practiced. His work, among many other results, helped ensure that significant investments were made in infrastructure and in caring for Californians' mental health. Allen also served several California governors in a variety of roles, including Governor George Duke Mason and Governor Pete Wilson. Allen also served our country as an Air Force officer during Vietnam. During the war, he was a captain and flight navigator in the KC-135, responsible for refueling spy planes. His time in the Air Force informed his approach throughout his life's work, from calmly managing a crisis to learning how to get the job done no matter the obstacles at hand. Apart from his service, Alan is also remembered as a kind individual, often making pizzas from scratch for friends at his home in Loomis. I was truly honored to, to know Alan, to work with Alan, and people throughout California will never forget the impact that he had and will continue to have for many, many years to come.